Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Sproles, and I'm the president of the New York School of Interior Design. And I want to thank you all for joining us this evening uh, for the ev evolution of interior design and alumni panel discussion. We are very excited to have five of our esteemed alumni with us tonight. Panelists Mariette Himes Gomez, George Marshall Peters, Erica Reuter, and Therese Rosarius, and our moderator, Becky Button. And I probably should have read it in the order that you're sitting, but um, we're also thrilled to see so many uh, familiar faces here in the audience tonight, so welcome. So in case you haven't heard or you've been living under a rock, uh, 2016 is the 100th anniversary of the New York School of Interior, Interior Design, and we are proud to be celebrating this milestone and revel in the opportunity to look back at our illustrious past while also looking to the future of the college and the profession itself. When we were discussing how to best commemorate our centennial, it was clear that we wanted to honor and, and involve our alumni. After all, the success of our alumni is really how we can measure our own success, that we are setting our students up for professional success. Now, one way we celebrated this is through the alumni exhibition, which opened last month in the NYSED Gallery. Uh, we invite you all to join us there for some drink and some food after tonight's discussion, and you can have a look at the work hanging on the walls. Another way to honor our alums is tonight's panel discussion. It marks the third annual alumni lecture, which is presented by NYSED's Alumni Council. The president of the council, uh, Lawrence Levy, he wanted to be here tonight to welcome everyone, but He's currently traveling and is out of the country. Uh, I, in his place, uh, will remind you of the many ways you can get involved with NYSID. Uh, you can become, as an alumni, I should say, you can become an alumni mentor, offer internships to our current students, hire our graduates, and help us to make the alumni scholarship robust for the next generation of interior designers. Uh, that's another way of saying we would love to get some money that we can then offer as a scholarship and in the name of the Alumni Association. Uh, it's been so great to see so many alumni throughout the year, especially at our annual benefit dinner last month, which was incredibly successful, and we hope to see you at future events. But back to the topic at hand, tonight's discussion, alumna Becky Button is serving as the moderator and she will introduce each of the panelists. Becky graduated from NYSED's BFA program in 2001 and has taught a number of courses at the college over the past decade. She is currently Principal and Design Director at Gensler, primarily focusing on workplace projects of all sizes and complexities in the financial services, tech, media, and professional services industries. In 2014, she was recognized by Engineering News Record as one of the top 20 under 40 professionals in the design and construction industry. She also served as a juror for the alumni exhibition. Uh, we want to thank Becky for her dedication to the college. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? OK. All right. So I'm going to do a little introduction of each of our wonderful panelists here tonight. Um, and then we're going to have some conversation around the evolution of interior design. So Mariette, many of you know, hardly needs an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. After attending the Rhode Island School of Design and graduating from the New York School of Interior Design, she worked for Edward Durrell Stone, Albert Hadley, and Sister Parrish before opening her own firm in 1975. Um, she, her work has been widely published, Architectural Digest, Traditional Home, House Beautiful, New York Times, Town and Country, it goes on and on. She's an author of three books. Uh, some of her many awards and accolades include Architectural Digest, uh, AD 100 Top Talent in Architecture and Interior Design, the Grand Masters of Design for El Decor, World's Top 20 Designers of All Time. Uh, 2004, she received House Beautiful's prestigious Giant of Design Award. <laughs> I'm making her blush, but I think it's worth it. I think we should hear these things. Um, 1994, inducted into the Interior Design Magazine Hall of Fame. In 2011, she won the highest award for ASID Designer of Distinction, and in 2014 was the recipient of the Albert Hadley Lifetime Achievement Award from the New York School of Interior Design. So we love you, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and so you've been cycling through some of the photos up there. I'm going to move on to George. So George 
moved to New York from his native Texas 27 years ago, and he came here to study at New York University where he just received his undergraduate degree in art history. Following graduation, he devoted a number of years to archaeology in Cyprus, which sounds awesome. And I'm going to pronounce this. You aren't going to know how hard it is to pronounce this word because you can't see it written, but it's pronounced Yoranasas Island, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, expedition and excavations at Suskiu with the University of Edinburgh, right? Um, off seasons, he spent dealing um, in 20th century design and decorative arts, the love of which led him to the New York School of Interior Design, where he completed his BFA in 2008. He was a bronze medal recipient and a Decorators Club Scholarship Award winner, and his work um, on several oca occasions has been featured in the NYSID News Magazine and promotional materials. You'll recognize some of his sketches and, and pretty renderings up there. Uh, George joined the residential firm of Pamela Banker Associates in 2004. And as an interior designer, he continues to work on the office's varied projects ranging from classic New York apartments to historic properties, state-of-the-art homes. Um, and also, he participated, loves participating in show houses, including Rooms with a View, Orchard Hill, and Holiday House. Also, has, uh, many of his drawings have appeared in a number of books and journals and magazines, including The Pocket Renovator, authored by Leslie and Pamela Banker. <laughs> Erica. Erica is a project manager with HOK. Uh, she's a certified interior designer, lead accredited professional and licensed architect. Uh, she earned her Bachelor's of Fine Arts and Master's in Fine Arts from the New York School of Interior Design and was the recipient of the Chairman's Award for her graduate work. She has previously taught construction documents two and contract one at NYSID. Uh, Erica has work experience from Fra Francis Kaufman and HOK and has been practicing as a designer for the last 10 years working on corporate interiors projects with a focus on media clients. Her work with Densu Aegis and the Teach for America has won awards from IFMA and Starnet. Uh, Erica has work published in the Commercial Observer, Interiors and Sources, and currently you can find her Teach for America project in Contract Magazine. It's a beautiful project. <laughs> and of course, Therese. Therese was born and raised in Housing Board, Sweden, educated in Sweden, China, and the United States. She founded her studio, Therese Viserius Studio, an interior architecture and design firm in 2003. She was rebranded Viserius Studio in 2013 when her sister Regina joined and is the creative director in the Paris office. So we have global, global offices, right? Therese is fluent in several languages, including Swedish, English, and Mandarin, and currently resides here in New York. Uh, her diverse educational and professional experiences have allowed her to appreciate the different cultures and brings a global understanding to her design. Uh, she works on a lot of hospitality projects, primarily, and has won many awards. Most recently, the winner of Best Lobby Public, public Area for her design at the Hyatt Regency in Montreal. Welcome. So now you guys all know who, who we have up here. And I would love to just see by a show of hands, how many students do we have in the audience tonight? OK. How many people in the industry as designers or, or vendors or, or affiliated industry professionals, 10 years or less practicing in the industry? OK. How about 10 to 20 years? OK. How about over 20 years? OK. <laughs> So we have a nice cross-section like we do up here on the stage. So I'd like to ask each of you to talk a little bit about your first project. So I'd like to start with Mariette. Obviously, you have a long history. And we'd love to just hear a little bit about what that was like. When was it? Tell us, you know, in the lens of evolution of interior design, tell us. Who was it? How'd you get it? What was it like? You could just pick one. Pick one that you like a long time ago. Um, but, oh, yeah. I mostly do residential work. I don't know how that happened. They just came, so I do. Um, I don't do anything commercial unless they have an office somewhere that they expect to uh, fix up or spiff up or do something. Um, I've had one client, I think we've done 10 projects for him all over the world. Uh, including Costa Rica and places like that. 
Um, the part of this that doesn't make sense to me is how people came to me before the publicity or before the whatever. Um, I think I, the only thing I could say is that it's probably word of mouth. I, I can't, I, when I was looking at our questions, I couldn't understand it because um, we never, we never uh, run ads, we never did anything like that, but nonetheless the clients come and they still keep coming, which is really great. People on this stage have massive offices and all. I mean, I have, at the most I ever had was 12 people and all, and now we're six. Um, and we just, we're continuously working, and I thank God for that. I would say your great work probably has a lot to do with why people come to you, so. Thank God for that. <laughs> uh, Therese, you next. Okay, uh, my first project. Hmm. I was working with Jeffrey Beers for a year and a half, and then I'm a little antsy kind of personality, so I like to have things move fast. I guess that's why I ended up in hospitality industry, because it's fast-moving industry, um, and it kind of fits my persona. So after a year and a half, I felt like, okay, I need to accelerate my process. So that's when I went out on my own, and I went, okay, how am I going to get my first project, and it's a little bit like how you say, it's a word of mouth, they, some Starwood people knew that I was at Jeffrey before, and then I went out on my own, so I got a hotel project, and getting a hotel project and doing interior design for not that many years at that point, uh, two, actually, and I got this Westin in Fort Lauderdale, and it was huge, massive, it was hundreds and thousands of square feet, and um, I was just one person at the time, so I, I kind of took a deep breath and I said, okay, I'll, I'll put my thinking hat on and kind of just being very logical of how to go through the spaces and that's how I, like that was my first project and, uh, and since then it's, uh, that's, that's 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Uh, well, the, the first project I guess that I was involved with, I, I maybe start with that. So, and I started with Pamela Banker Associates. Uh, one of the things that she was working on at that time was um, uh, a, a property in Connecticut that was done by uh, Richard Morris Hunt. And it, it was interesting because I started with her sort of part-time, mostly to do a drafting and drawing and that sort of thing. So the plans for most of these projects would end up on the drafting table and I'd be working with them to uh, varying degrees. And so I had an opportunity to um, to look at a project that, that mirrored a lot of the things that we were learning in school at that time in the historical styles classes and things like that. So it was a great learning experience for me. I mean, it was the first thing that I was ever really involved with. And also to see how she approached, uh, uh, Pam approached the project, uh, you know, from start to finish. It was a wonderful experience with, you know, existing structures such as that with, the, you know, historical pedigree. And um, that was really where it started. That was the first thing that I was involved with. Erica? So finding a job was a little difficult when I graduated. It was in 2006. So it was just sort of starting to, everything was sort of starting to tank. Um, I knew I didn't want to work in residential, but the only jobs that I could find in New York City were residential. So I actually explored uh, jobs in Philadelphia, ended up getting a job with Francis Kaufman, which in Philadelphia is a pretty big firm. Um, I started off on a contract project for Project Management Institute, and uh, at first it was a very robust team, but it quickly crumbled. <laughs> and our project manager got relocated to Baltimore, and the senior designer got a new opportunity, left the firm, and it was very much a uh, trial by fire <laughs> situation. But um, so I asked a lot of questions, tried to reference you know, past projects that have been completed, and tried to use that as a reference to push through it. So um, building on this idea, of a lot of you mentioned these clients, and some of you might still be working with some of those clients. Um, who knows? I want to talk a little bit about client relationships, because in our industry, as we know, as Marriott mentioned, you know, these people just come to you. They find you, and that's through word of mouth, repeat business, that kind of thing. So how important is uh, your relationships with your clients? And maybe you could talk a little bit about 
one that's particularly memorable or something that's unusual or something that's really important to you in terms of a client that has that you've worked with over the years. Anyone want to start? <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's not so much that it's a, a client and like that type of relationship. It kind of turns into also being close friends in a way that they have to respect you and you have to respect them. Because if you don't have that type of relationship, it's going to be a very abusive situation, right? So um, having a very open and honest relationship with your clients, I think it's absolutely key. Because they will continue coming back to you and respect you. Um, deliver on your word is also something that is very important for, for clients that are entrusting them or entrusting you with uh, large budgets or large projects and fast projects or whatever the project may be. If it's a residential, it's a little bit more close to heart because it's more personal. When it's a hotel, which we primarily focus on, it, it is more in regards to time, um, how you can manage that and also how if you can deliver on time, basically. Because if you renovate a hotel, and all of a sudden you're eight months delayed with your drawings, that's not a good repertoire at all. So having that open relationship and be, be able to also dare say to them that we have an issue here, we have a situation here, and like be honest about it. Because uh, it will come back and bite you if you don't. If you try to put it under the rug, it's going gonna, it's gonna to come out. So it is tremendously important. And also over time, I think, you weed out your clients, just as your clients weed, weed out you, right? You find those relationships that are really healthy, and then the other ones, they, they fall off after, after a time. But in the beginning, when you start a company or when you work for another company, uh, you're less picky, if you want to call it that, or you're, you're a little bit more, you put up with more, I would say. But then after a while, you, it's usually a mutual um, agreement. If it's a good relationship, you stay, and if it's not, uh, move on, and no hard feelings. So, I have something to add. You always, 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 always want to use their money, not your own. So if they don't pay on time, they don't get it on time. I mean, and they have to understand that. I'm very clear with people at the beginning of a project that things take time. I mean, if you're making custom this or that, or making furniture, or curtains, or or you're ordering special carpeting. So, so I make it clear in our early meetings that that's essential because no one, anyone in this office should use their own money to do the work for people who have it and expect to spend it. So that's my take on that. Do you have a favorite client? Um, yes, I do. Um, and I've done many, many things for them and I just get to do it because they trust me wherever it is. But. Um, all my clients are favorites, and I can tell and I can sense when they come in whether or not they're completely interested and they want to get the job done or if they're just spending time decorating. Do you know what I mean? Um, and so it really generally uh, is both man and woman if it's a husband and wife because the wife will want one thing and he wants the other. So you have to sort all that out. But the bottom line is it always has to be spent their money because they're buying things for them. We charge fees, we don't charge markups. Um, I, I did that years ago, I thought it was sensible. Um, we can give them a budget and then you go from the budget um, and sometimes things are too expensive so you have to find a substitute. But it really is in our business and, it, and it's not a decorating business, it's a design business, it's serious, people want what they want in their houses, their homes, their offices. And so you give it to them, but it truly is their responsibility to make the choices, and you're just make, going to make sure it gets there on time. So it's interesting to hear the residential part of it because you know with corporate work, it's so it's less personal for the people. Um, so that's interesting to hear. But I also find it interesting now that clients are really in, well informed about design. They, it's everywhere. They can use Instagram or, um, what's the other one, the Pinterest, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and they just know about design a lot more. There's all these TV shows, which is great because it sets their level of expectation pretty high, but it's also a negative because they have 
unrealistic expectations about time and budget. Mm -hmm. And at least for corporate work, it's becoming kind of a difficult challenge. Interesting it, challenge, but difficult. Is it the same with international as it is with, in, within this country? Not as much. Yeah. That's a good point. So a lot of our clients that are in the Middle East or in Asia, it, it's not as much of a budget constraint. George, any thoughts? Well, I, 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 it's sort of a combination of uh, the last two comments, is what Marianne said and Erica, that um, I think, the, of course, the client relationship is a critical thing in, in any project, but you also need to set boundaries and manage expectations and, and those sorts of things you want to get sorted out early. Uh, Pamela Banker Associates has been you know, very uh, lucky to have a, a good client base of a lot of repeat uh, work, and so you have the relationships that are established that you're maintaining. Um, but with new work and new relationships, it's very critical to, of course, you want to work with people that you, you get along with, that you have a good rapport, but you also want to be clear uh, that they understand you know, what it is that you do and how it functions. And increasingly, I think the technology is placing uh, new demands on the way the, the, the industry is developing. And it's, uh, it's an interesting time because, you know, you, you, there, I'm not sure there's any real one solution to how to handle that. And, and, in, and in so far as that every client's different, every uh, situation is as well but yes yeah very important building on that we were just talking earlier and I know you you do a lot of work by hand so let's talk about technology a little and like what kind of tools you use to do your work do you do all your work by hand do you use computers at all Mariette told us she does not have a computer on her desk which I think is amazing <laughs> that sounds great to me <laughs> I gotta there's wait. one right outside my door though. oh there you go <laughs> Um, do, do you want me to start with yeah, that? Yes, like what, well, how do you do, what do you, what kind of tools do you use when you're I, doing a project? I mentioned in passing, I, I started um, with the firm to do drawings specifically. Um, and, by and hand, by you hand, did yeah, by yeah, hand. Yeah, all the drafting by hand. And, um, you know, that occasionally presents some problems. The nature of what we have always really done, it, it, it's, um, it's been in many ways the best way. Uh, the time that you get to spend with the plans, I felt like having learned CAD in school and, and having, I would say it's an excellent skill to have, um, but that you have a different relationship with the documents than you do than doing handwork. I mean, that's in the technical drawing side of it. Um, I think there's things that you understand about space sometimes, not probably always, but uh, by having to literally drag the pencil across the you know, straight edge that, that, that I didn't get from it doing, uh, doing it in the computer. But that's really probably more of a personal thing. Um, sketching, I think, is a great tool. It's, it's sort of wired with the way I think. So um, I have to do it. Um, it's helpful in meetings and things like that to be able to, to draw on that skill to establish whether or not you've understood what someone's trying to communicate or for you to be able to better communicate the things that you want to do. Um, but I, I think really probably some sort of hybrid between the two, you know, using your technology and your uh, more analog skills uh, successfully is another thing. Do you thing draw you on to CAD do. now? Do you use CAD for I anything? Don't. No. I don't. Does your, does your company use it for anything? We don't, no. no. Okay. Yeah, we do not. Uh, Eric, I'm going to jump to you because you are Utah Revit and you are highly proficient in computers. Tell us a little bit about what, you know. I can turn works. them on. <laughs> um, yeah, so HRK has become kind of all Revit-based at this point. Uh, and on the reverse side, we've actually used for a couple clients walkthrough technology to just walk through the space and to help them understand the spatial analysis of what you know, certain like, areas are going to start to look like. Um, I think it's a great tool, but I agree. I feel like there's a little bit of sketching missing, and I, I wish that there was more hand sketching and there was more time for that development, that process. Unfortunately, there isn't always that time, and Revit is a great tool to kind of kill two birds with one stone. You can do plans and get 3D at the same time. Yeah, it's nice that you get to both with the same it's time. Right. Mary, how, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think that if you, if you have, you have to kind of do some sketching as well, because if you get stuck in the computer, you will have a hard time to understand proportion and scale in reality. So. I usually have my office print, if, if they don't get it, like print one-to-one -one scale, and then they will go like, oh, wow, we didn't realize that it was that big. So it's kind of important to, to, to have a cross, crossover. 
and also, again, if it's commercial design and hospitality design, <clears throat> maybe your presentations also are slightly different because you come in and there's a whole boardroom of people and you won't have that nice opportunity to necessarily sit and sketch something out because they're, they're in and out like this. They want to see it, they make a judgment, and then they kind of, you don't have that developed discussions of, of space as much as I think you do in a, in a residential atmosphere. Marriott, how do you well, how do you convey your designs? We do floor plans. We do, we do everything to scale, so I make sure everything is correct. I don't believe in renderings, though. I shouldn't say that in the school, but um, I think I think they're uh, you can the say anything you want. Off. The, 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 the proportion they're very deceptive, and in residential work, um, you don't want to do that because whatever they saw in a, either two-dimensional or three-dimensional. Um, they, they just don't get it. So we really just do plans. But when they come in for our first meeting, um, I have all the backup for everything that's in the plan so I can actually tell them visually. Sometimes I have furniture delivered, everything, just so they know. We don't go shopping with our clients 90% um, of the time um, because that's just a lot of time. And we charge fees. We don't charge markups on everything. So. There is a case where something needs to be seen, if it's a piano, a grand piano or something. But um, it, it's really essential to us to have a floor plan and everything in scale. But the idea of, of uh, two point or one point perspectives, we don't do that anymore. We, I don't think we ever did it. I did great renderings, but I didn't do it for my clients. <laughs> So to help your clients understand what the whole space will look like, do you just have images of, how do you do that? How do you oh, show I them? I have big samples, samples. I, ha I have pictures, I have all these things so they can see what they're getting. But again, I really do feel that sometimes things are, they don't understand it. So why do all of that for them to get misinformed about what something's going to look like? And I think you're lucky because they obviously trust you and you've built that trust with them and I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to add something to that, that, um, that that's also how we typically work. We don't have occasion to do full renderings of spaces. That they, they are often very deceptive and what people are responding to are the, is the drawing and not the content. Right. So it's always very difficult to tell what someone sees, in a, which is also one of the problems I think with the technology is that it's got so easy to send. It's, it's a far cry from now from just tearing a page out of a magazine to being able to, um, to, to, you know, submit to your, your designer uh, hundreds of images, and it, whereas it's very helpful, it's not always clear what someone's seeing. So in the same sense, like the drawing is a great tool to sometimes express an idea or concept that you can discuss about right. if it's difficult, but it's not an end in itself. It's really, you have to conjure. Uh, I think get it, it gets people confused, yeah, often. oftentimes, oftentimes. Erica, can you imagine doing no, a presentation? No, I can't. I can't imagine not <laughs> yeah. having a commercial. It's a little different. Yeah, different. yeah. 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 It's, so, it's the total to opposite. You know, yeah. most of our clients cannot read a floor plan uh -huh. yeah. or an elevation to save their life. So everything has to be three dimensional almost. And but one thing that I have seen change since I first started working is that there's less uh, 3D Max or any kind of realistic rendering. It's a lot more going towards the sketchier side. And I don't know if that's something that's common or if it's just been my experience. No, I, I actually think that's true because when we do concept presentations, we would use SketchUp and then we actually do hand sketching on top of the SketchUp. And then so it doesn't look so static. And then um, we throw in maybe one color, but not like a full on, on rendering. It's not that it doesn't happen until like schematic. Then that for sure happens. If we would come in to a presentation without a, a 3D rendering, the client would wonder what we were doing. They, they would actually be, be very, hmm, what, where's the renderings? Because that, that's, they need to see it. And then after that, we build a model room. So then it becomes, then the 3D becomes an actual reality before we go into a room. Oh, I might say something. Can you, can you hear me? Um, we, we actually um, don't do one point perspective or two points perspective because we think that they don't get it. Um, but we will show them exactly what it is and the size and all that. And if they don't understand it, then I don't put it in. Um, 
I think because I've been so successful in my business, and I often wonder how and why, but I'm very practical. I grew up in the Midwest, and you just, you just do things the right way and make people understand, and it's not, it's not that idea of something that is special or unusual or, or, or they, they just don't get that, that whole concept when we do perspectives. And I have people who can do them, but I think it's deceiving in terms of scale and everything. But you're right, they have to see the whole picture. How many people would there have been in that office project you were talking about? Well, anyone, I mean, pick one. In the, in the presentation, yeah. how many people? No, no, how many bodies would be in a particular place? An office, say. So we do hotels. Yeah, primarily. oh, so, so it's 100 rooms? It can be anything from 300 to 1,000. Rooms. Yeah. So you have a program per room, probably. Yeah, because it's all different yeah. types. But usually in the hotel, we would do like one or two model rooms mm -hmm. after all the designs has been approved. Mm -hmm. Because then it, then it becomes very practical. You go in, you physically feel it, you can, you see if some proportions may not work because the rooms are slightly off in, in size from what they were on the cat drawings. Or, you know, there's, as in every interior design project, you have on-site situations so those kind of things. So. What happens to us is someone comes who's going to do a big office or something, they hire someone to do the office and then they hire us to do the president's office and maybe a couple of other offices of juniors and all because we're more hands-on for that than we are doing it by um, volume. Yeah, never done volume. So uh, let's talk a little bit about things like budget and schedule. How have the expectations on projects changed over through your career? Are, you know, are things moving faster? They want things cheaper. What's going on? Tell us. Erica, you can, <laughs> you can start. You tell us. All of it. <laughs> faster, cheaper, um, more in that time frame. Uh, it's, it's been very difficult, I think, that you know, through this recession that we've gone through, both architects and interior designers have sold themselves short, unfortunately. We've been underbidding ourselves and we've put ourselves into a situation currently that I think is gonna be very difficult to get out of in the future. Um, I have no resolution for it. I have no other words of wisdom other than- Because we don't charge enough fees and, we, and people yes. want a lot of work and they yes. don't wanna pay for it. and then we are understaffed, which is not good for anybody. I have no answer. <laughs> <laughs> you keep putting them in the middle. <laughs> I think interior designers like undervalue undervaluate their own own being, like the capacity that we do and how difficult our our profession is. Um, and we're maybe not very good at communicating that to clients. Because they're gonna, <clears throat> yeah, but you can, you can just put that concept together, right? And we'll see it in a week. And <clears throat> that's not the case. That is not the case. It's actually a very complicated process if it's gonna be something that <clears throat> adds value to the clients, that has some type of meaning for the property or for the, the family, or it, it's, it takes time. You need to think about it. It's not just a rabbit that you pull out of your hat. And I think that because the mood is very fast, they expect everything to just go like this. And the TV shows, doesn't help. It doesn't help at all. I can't, I can't stand them, actually. <laughs> so. Well, also, the, like, go to technology to some extent as well, is that I think that, that um, and, and to some of what you were saying, is that um, people, a lot of clients, especially we counter this with, I think, with the younger clients that have not been through the process as many times, that there is a, oftentimes a, a lack of understanding and, and what goes into achieving the results that you, 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 know, you want to be known for. And um, it, it's hard for them to understand why you can't just go on a thing like first dibs. It's so you know, prevalent. Uh, and you could get to so much product so quickly, pricing and all these sorts of things. And, you know, it's hard to understand, like, uh, why they can't just do it themselves. So there's a lot of, you know, the, I think the clients, it's, the process seems fun. It's very charming and interesting when you see it on the programs. Uh, and it, it is in actuality oftentimes many parts of it. But there, there, it is, 
there's a lot of it that, that um, is a great deal of work. It's, it's not simple. It's not always just fun, you know. And so we encounter people that are very interested in, um, in being a part of the process, which can make things, co make things complicated and goes to, of course, to budget and schedule and, you know, uh, how you have to handle those considerations. And, and, and then that goes back to boundaries and, and yeah. expectations. I just thought of something. It takes an architect to build a house or out an office or all, like how many years a house from start to finish with permits and all that. And so if they get the designer in early, we're able to accommodate. And I'm looking here and saying, I wonder how long it took for these chairs to get here. <laughs> Look, I mean, really, you just, you just simply have to wait. Um, and the, the best thing that could happen is that the designer is hired the same time the architect's hired. Because then you're surely to come out at the same time, pretty much, and not have this business about where's it, when's it coming. And it also has a lot to do when they pay for it. I mean, if they want it, they have to pay for it. You have to pay for it before you order it, some of these things, especially if you're ordering 100 chairs. So it is, a, that's, that's a bit of an issue. Do you have a comment? Well, knowing that, uh, you know, time and budget is something that we all deal with and making sure our clients understand what kinds of, so when you have people coming and um, you're joining your firms who, when they're coming out of school, what kinds of skills should people in the audience, we have a lot of students here, what are the most important skills for these students to have when they come and what, what's going to be the most valuable for them coming into your industries? Well, nowadays, I, I think knowing more programs, the better. Uh, it just, especially coming out of school, because you're going to be on the Which programs, programs do you guys of, use the most? Definitely Revit is the key. Uh, a lot of Photoshop, not as much 3D Max, but definitely a helpful tool to have. Um, all of the Adobe suites. InDesign? Using yeah, all yeah. of the Adobe suites, yeah. So InDesign, uh, Illustrator, all of that stuff. Uh, that's the easy part, right? So the, you take those programs and you can directly take those, that knowledge and apply it to a job. Uh, I think the more difficult skill that is also important is detailing, understanding the limits of materials and understanding how those materials all come together is incredibly important and I think it's undervalued, uh, definitely, just as designers because we want to design pretty things. But that's where your design comes to fruition. It's where you're going to be able to photograph it and get your ne next job. So you can design the most beautiful thing. but. If you don't know how to build it correctly, you're not going to get the next job. So I think detailing and computer programs. I also think that they have to have a aesthetic um, sensibility. Um, because we're all, in the end, you see the aesthetic of what you're creating. They have to have a fantasy. So I don't know if you teach fantasy or you just kind of have fantasy. I have no <laughs> idea, actually. Maybe, maybe I mean, some people have a lot of fantasy and some people don't have any fantasy at all, right? But, so fantasy. Vision. 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 <laughs> yeah, fantasy and vision is really important. The other, the other things that Erica talked about, those are tools. Those are, those are just basics. That's like reading and writing. You should just know them, right? But the, you need to have that other, that hard to put the finger on. One of the things that I would say, in, in a general sense, I think coming through uh, the program here that was most helpful to me, I find is, is the process, going through the process of presenting, which we had to do so, so often, uh, is that really applying yourself to that and, and being there on time with what you need, you really learn a lot about the process. And that is the same thing that happens in professional careers, that you frequently, you have to meet a deadline and understanding what goes into that. and. Um, you know, learning how to make the compromises that you that are sometimes difficult to make to, to make sure that you you're getting the best thing that that you possibly can to produce the best product that you can possibly produce for the client, and so I, I can't really stress enough that I think that that's really that's a lesson that you're learning. You know, you think you're just trying to produce for the for the class, but it's the process of producing for the class. It's actually one of the most valuable uh, valuable things that I took away from the program, among many others, but certainly that. In commercial applications, do you give them more than one um, option? Yeah, scheme. So do yeah. they do they have a hard time choosing? No, not really. They don't really have a hard time choosing because they are they are very focused on on how to get it done on time and within budget. But you need to push them too, right? You push the envelope a little bit, otherwise they're not going to be fun. One other thing. Organized. Oh, yes. That is key because if you're not organized and 
you have five different projects and they're back to back deadlines and how, how to prioritize it, if you don't know how to organize yourself, it all becomes scrambled eggs. Also knowing when to stop. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. there's it's an endless process design. So uh, earlier we were talking a little bit about you know, social media. And so we are talking about the evolution of design. Obviously when many of us, actually probably when all of you started, I know most of you, there was no social media, there was no internet in some cases. But even, you know, in the last few years it's really become quite prevalent. Does anyone have want to share any thoughts about what your firm is doing or what you're doing or not doing <laughs> in I, relationship I to that? I had to ask yesterday if we were online. <laughs> <laughs> And they printed all of these projects that I've done, and they said, yes, these are online. You are online. I looked you up. <laughs> <laughs> there's old school, and there's new school. And then there's residential, and there's commercial. So uh, it's, it's interesting. I, I just always work very hard, and I'm always traveling. So I ask those questions of others, because I have to sort of be the prime mover, as it were. Social media, I think, is, is, is key. Key maybe not to get projects, but just to be seen as a buzz, a buzz in the background, basically. I mean, I know I might be a marketing person, she's here, because <laughs> she will most likely put some Twitter, and like, it, it's just how it, in, in hospitality design, it is like that. If I go to HD Magazine show, everything happens on Twitter, and instantly. They do comparative shopping for someone to do a huge project, so you have to present even though you don't get the job necessarily. It's different from Europe versus US. Yes. Um, Europe has a lot of competitions, mm -hmm. so you compete mm -hmm. for projects. US, you get invited to bid, and then basically you submit a proposal, unless it's a very large project. And they, See, that's, that's good information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, did you hear what I said? Or? <laughs> so HRK is on you know, every social media at this point. Uh, I will say that they were a little slow to the Instagram account, so there's only like three pictures up there <laughs> right now. Um, but I think there's so many different levels of social media now because everybody has a LinkedIn account, and then everybody has a website, and then you also have your company website, and there's just so many steps to all of it. Um, I use social media mostly for inspiration and just to see what else was out there, but I, I'm not very good at showcasing my work though. I haven't gotten there. So you mentioned inspiration, so I think it would be nice to hear from each of you. What, it, what inspires you? Like how do you keep coming up with new ideas over time and what, you know, what gets you excited about design? Where do you get your inspiration from? <laughs> I don't know, my eyes see everything. I mean, I was given this, I, I mean, I see everything. So I already know. You guys can hear, right? Yeah. 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 I, I already know what it's supposed to look like. So I usually give them more than one solution. But I'll say this is the one that I think is the best because it's commer it's not commercial necessarily. It's mostly residential. Um, but I do, I just see everything and I put it together in my head. I don't know, it's a gift God gave me, these eyes, because I just... I almost, I don't go shopping anymore, I don't do anything like that, but when a new client comes in, I know what they want and I know what we're gonna give them. And it works that way. Do you have a favorite place you go to like relax and get rejuvenated? I have a house in Remsenburg, actually there are four houses there. Um, you have four You have four houses there? Yeah, yeah. there's the main house and then my daughter has a little house. And you have, you have an estate, I would say. Right? It's an what? estate. It's more of an estate, it sounds like. What? An estate. You no, an estate. it's modest. It's in Remsenburg. It's not in the Hamptons. Um, but no, to me to relax is to sit down and read a book, actually. Just to get away from all that stuff that goes on in there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you need to get away from like all the noise. Because yes. there's so much noise. And um, it doesn't, I mean, if you're constantly in this, you see images and you see all that, you, your brain doesn't get to relax, so it doesn't get to, you don't get to tap into the inner part of yourself, mm -hmm. and that's when you, when you start to do that, and how you do that is different. Maybe people take a walk in the forest, or I travel quite a bit, I mean, and then I will go to a museum and I'll go look at art, or, but I try to get away actually from people, 
because it's it's a constant buzz and it's just noise. So that going into a little cocoon is, is, is my thing. I, I also I find that to be helpful as well. Breaking the routine uh, and since all the, you know since it's sort of connected one forms the other to some extent. It, it's not always it's you know necessarily looking at design but looking at, at anything finding a place where you can sort of be quiet and things come to you if you're in this business you know it, it's sort of what you, you um, thrive on is sort of new things and that could be really anything whether it's you know music or art or, or just yeah. a different experience and travel is a wonderful way to do it um, but you know it can be as simple as you say like taking a walk in the woods you know if you have an opportunity to see things differently and I think it's probably in all our nature to constantly be searching for something you know new or different um, that, uh, that that's breaking the routine you know getting out stop for a minute do something different. I have a question. Does anybody have your home telephone number? I don't give it to anybody. Well, that's an interesting question because... When you go home, you're home. When you're at work, right. you're at work. No, but cell phone, you know, talking about technologies and things, the yeah. uh, iPhones, I guess it's any smartphone really, um, that the f being able to take photographs, it starts with a thing I like do that. that. Okay. Photographs. photographs are, and, and oftentimes a picture really is worth a thousand words. Working with the workrooms, you can take a picture of a detail and you can be at the workroom, get it back to the office, have a discussion. So your and, memory and, isn't right. like proud. Right, right. but also that you can have other people looking at the same thing you're right. looking at right. to make mm -hmm. decisions in a much more efficient manner. But that's kind of how it starts. So then the next thing is, you know, you're communicating with your, your um, your trades and your subs via cell phone, and then you know how, how many devices do you want to carry? So then you're you're with your personal device, and then you know it's not a very far leap to end up where you're in direct communication with clients, and then with younger clients and some of the older clients too that have embraced the technology. You're into text messaging, you're into phone calls and emails that you're receiving on your phone. I mean, all it makes you more efficient, but it can also it, again it gets to boundaries you have and to have trying boundary. to find a way to yeah. balance all that. Yeah, it's very difficult thing to deal with because it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing, but it's not without its um, you know, difficulties. Erica, how do you get inspired? Yeah. Um, I actually start with the client just because all of our clients are these big corporations that have these very strong brands. Um, I start the client, understand what they do, and try to get to a, kind of a simplified level of a concept from that, that research. And I don't have a good example right now, uh, but from that, I will start to look for um, inspiration images to try to create like a mood board, and then I will eventually start to look at other images. But I totally agree with you, Therese. I don't like to look at images all the time. I think it just gets confusing. There's too much stuff going on out there. I like to start more simply concept mood, mood board, and then if I need to look for precedent images, I'll start to look for interior images. So we, I, we have a little bit of time left. I do want to open it up for questions, but I do have one last question for all of you. If you have any predictions for the future in the next few years, what, you know, what does the future of interior design look like? Do you see things changing now? I know that's a big question, but you know, what's coming? What's, how are you doing things differently now? And what do you see happening maybe in the next few years? Any thoughts on that? I'm interested to see if there's a closer collaboration with uh, contractors earlier in the stage. So because we're going so quickly, I wonder if that means we're going to eventually do, do more design build work rather than have all of these different processes. Uh, so right now we do the schematic design, and well, programming, schematic design, design development, construction documents, and then we construct this whole thing. I wonder if that design development construction document space actually molds into directly into construction and design construction. <laughs> well, I, I actually wanted the same thing. In, in some instances, I mean, there will be a trend. But isn't everything like cycles? So now it cycles going really, really, really fast. But then it starts to go slow again, and then slow, and then it goes fast. Everything is a cycle. So interior designer, is it a five year cycle? Seven year cycle? In regards to like how intense it is with projects? I think it depends on the economy. Yeah, no, exactly. But that's like seven years, right? Seven years and something happens. So you know, maybe it will start to slow down. <laughs> Hello? I guess it depends who becomes president. We won't get into that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um,
Does anyone in the audience have any questions for our panelists? Oh, here, I'll come out. Hi, I'm Shaquana. I'm a BID student. Um, my question is for both residential and commercial. How long does it typically take for your projects? What is your average project <coughs> for like a home versus a, an average size office? A residence is probably around six months, I would think. Depending on if they already own it or they're buying it or whatever, that's about six months. But if you build from scratch, I don't know, it takes years. Yeah, I mean, if I look at um, a restaurant, everything from six months to 12 months, I would say. A hotel, everything from a year to three years. And with commercial offices, anywhere from nine months to I wanted to ask you, if, just imagine that you've got a really good project coming up and you need an assistant to come from school or from some other place. Can some of you address what would be your ideal in the person you would want to hire to take on that job, work with you as an assistant? And what would you expect them to do? have in the way of training. First of all, I wouldn't hire them just when you were starting a job. I would already have one that, that you trained and you knew that they listened to you and you listened to them and they were smart and talented and came from the school and that well, kind of thing. What if they just, if you were going to train them, what do you want in the first place? What um, what are the credentials or what? Um, do they need to have a degree? Maybe that's a, right? <coughs> yeah, I mean, I think what they need to have is. have to bring to the job? Uh, it all depends on what they're going to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, but a minimum, they would have the AutoCAD, they would have. I mean, in my office, it's not like I have a, a personal assistant um, because they're all interior designers and architects. So they would have to have the, as we said before, all technical programming skills. What about make. design, like history of architecture, or detailing, for detailing? All what of that. that yeah, I mean, they would have to have all of that. They, I mean. Are you talking about having someone freelance just for this job, or you're yeah, hiring someone? Someone you're going to hire, you're really becoming successful, and you want to get someone to come in and work with you. I think you should interview people, and, and the yeah, relationship and will and happen when you interview. What do you find out about them, want to find out? It sounds like it could be. I mean, like not only appearance, or you know, whether they're going to present themselves to the client, but what what are their skills that you want or knowledge you want? I suspect if they came from the school, they're very well qualified. Yeah. My assistant yeah. came yeah. from the school. Yeah. My personal assistant came from the school. I, I, I was going to say, I think I'd be all of it. I mean, really, anybody that you, you would bring on, you know, unless you're talking about, you know, somebody just to you know, help returning samples or something like that. I mean, I think you, most people would be interested in a junior design position or moving up through the, through the industry. And so all of those things, uh, knowledge of the marketplace, the historical styles, uh, but fundamental skills, even things that they won't necessarily use in practice, knowledge of them makes them better at, at, at what they will do, I think. And so, so all of it uh, makes you better equipped. I mean, the program, I, I, you know, I'm biased having been through it, but I thought it was excellent. Uh, and there really wasn't much of anything that I mean, there are things that I, that I found more helpful and useful than, than others, but certainly, you know, uh, a lot of the skills you pick up, uh, learning how to be you know, careful of your time, uh, you know, pay attention to what you're doing, your eyes open, your knowledge of the marketplace. Develop your creativity. Right, yeah. I think curiosity and drive right. is yeah. something that's really important. Yeah. Yeah. So for furniture, what is your favorite furniture? You mean retail, like furniture? 
furniture that you can pr purchase for yes. retail? Like for, maybe it's more of a residential question, but which companies do you find yourself going back to and why? You have um, you have uh, Janus to see you have Walters, you have like uh, these type of companies. Uh, well, I mean, we go back to those because it's a long relationship. So that you know when stuff happens, you know that they got your back. Because right. things will happen for sure. So you, you can't just have some random vendor that you don't really you know. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, it's, it's the relationship. Do any of your tech clients use retail furniture in <coughs> West Elm? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's, sorry, that's a new thing. And again, because of the They go on the main rail, West Elm, as well as the restoration hardware. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, we used to always specify commercial grade furniture, but now it's, the industry's really changed. And mm -hmm. we're specifying a lot of things that you would specify for your home. Any other questions? Why do you think that, that it, do you think it's because the access of people I think at the end it is less expensive, even though you know, the dealer's not getting uh, a discounted price to you know, purchase it, it's still less expensive than going to contract. Um, but then you can also go access. You can also go custom made. Right. Yeah. There's Which someone in the audience here who does, does yes. a great job. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question back there. Yeah. Um, a couple of you touched on this, which I thought was great about that. You know, no job is perfect. There's, there will be problems. There and I'm just curious what the best way of, uh, of dealing with that is with not only the client when there's a problem, but the vendor. Um, you know, how do you deal with them in a way where you know that you're going to need to use this vendor again, so you don't want to scream your head off at them, but you want to make it very crystal clear that this is not acceptable. How do you, what do you, you know, how do you deal with that? I think be honest. Yeah. I mean, they usually know if they messed up, right? Yeah. Well, I think sometimes, too, you have to, you don't have to, I think it's difficult to, you, sometimes if you're too aggressive, you know, people are just by nature going to end up in a more defensive position. It's important to, to, if you have a good relationship with your, your vendors, your sources, that you're in it together, regardless of really sort of, so it's, it's about moving towards solutions, that's the main thing, and not compounding the problem. Um, sometimes, you know, really disagree about where something went off the rails. Uh, it's kind of a case by case scenario, but yes, like as you say, it's never too helpful to get too hot about it. You just have to be convinced that there is a solution and you're fine. You can do it together. You know. That's the answer your question. <laughs> Thank you. Would you say that in general your careers are mostly collaborative or more solitary? Like, are you working on the project? assistants and generally someone handles this job and someone handles this job and this job and then I handle all of them and those jobs. But um, so it's kind of a collaboration actually between the people that work for me and, and my own uh, sort of take on it. Our office is collaborative as well. Yeah, yeah I think the best results often that, that way. Absolutely collaborative because there's so many moving parts and it's impossible. <laughs>